Welcome to this video in which we introduce the idea of distributed forces and show how in many circumstances a distributed force can be replaced by a single equivalent uh, concentrated force, which makes things much easier to work with. So imagine the following situation. We have here a box and the box rests on the floor and gravity pulls on the box. In particular, uh, each, if I break the box up into little tiny bits, each little tiny bit is going to have gravity exert on it. So each, each little individual bit of the box oops, is going to have gravity tugging down on it. And so this gravity is a distributed force. It acts over, it actually acts on every part of the box, not just on one particular part. It's um, also the case that the floor that the box rests on is also going to push up against the box. If it didn't, of course, the box would just sink into the ground, and that's generally considered bad behavior for floors. Okay, so everywhere there's contact, the floor is pushing up on the box. Okay, so this is another example of a distributed force where I have contact that goes over, um, in this case, maybe several feet or several meters, and everywhere there's contact, uh, the floor or some other object is pushing on the object of interest. So distributed forces are all around us, and in fact, many, if not most, of the forces that you actually observe in nature are distributed. Um, but they're hard to work with in terms of doing analysis, uh, static equilibrium analyses, things like that. And uh, quite often, in order to work with them, you must solve uh, integral equations, which can be uh, fairly difficult. So what we would like to do is we would like to replace distributed forces. So for example, all of these little bits of contact force that are pushing the box up, we'd like to replace them by a single equivalent force. And this force would be equivalent in the sense that it produces the same net force, in this case against the box, and it also produces the same moment as gravity does around any point on the box. So the idea would be, again, the idea is to take these distributed forces and replace them by a single force because then we can use all the good stuff we know about um, uh, doing uh, static equilibrium analysis or dynamic analysis. Uh, it just makes life a lot easier. Now we can do this as long as we're not looking at internal forces so for, and to illustrate that, consider the following. Each of these yellow things um, may or may not look like it, but think of this as a foot, okay? So this is the ankle. There's an ankle over here. You've got the foot, you know, toes, toenails, all that stuff, okay? And when you stand on a hard surface, that uh, you exert a downward force on that hard surface, which is distributed over your foot. That hard surface exerts an upward force. If that hard surface did not exert an upward force, again, you'd sink into the floor, and uh, that would be bad. In real life, that uh, the force that the floor exerts on you is distributed over the area of contact for your foot. What we want to do is we want to consider this as an as um, an equivalent force. Now you can imagine standing here on the floor where the floor pushes up equally against you versus standing on the floor where only one point on the floor is pushing up against you with your entire weight. Both will keep you from sinking into the floor but this one's going to hurt uh, because all of the force would be concentrated at one point. If you don't believe me, uh, go find a fairly narrow uh, stick and stand on it barefoot. Okay. So as long as we're interested in the foot as a whole and what happens to the foot as a whole, 
we can take these distributed forces and create equivalent forces. But if we're looking at shear forces or bending moments or deformation or things like that, then making the substitution changes the problem. So you need to be a little careful when you're making these assumptions or, or changing from distributed to um, concentrated forces that you are not going to be looking at loading in a beam, for example, or other types of things that consider internal forces or internal stresses or deformation. So let's look for a minute at gravity. Uh, gravity is one of the distributed forces that um, we use a lot. And uh, the idea is that if I have an object, say maybe a square, I want to replace the distributed force of gravity by an equivalent force at the object's center of mass. Whoops. Okay, so I want to take all of the uh, forces that operate on this guy due to gravity and replace it by a force acting at its center of mass. Okay, if the density of the object is constant, then the center of mass is going to be at uh, points of symmetry uh, where um, uh, two lines, for example, two lines of symmetry intersect. And then the, the equivalent force is going to be the gravitational constant times the mass of the object. So if we have a square, or a rectangle even, in this case I've drawn the center of mass like this because there's actually uh, two lines of symmetry. I, I can flip uh, this rectangle about this line of symmetry and it looks the same. I can flip it about this line of symmetry and it looks the same. So again, if I have two lines of symmetry, uh, where those lines intersect represents the center of mass. So um, this holds true for other symmetrical things like circles. Uh, we'd expect the center of mass of a circle to be in the middle. Uh, if I have um, long, thin things like rods or beams, we would expect the center of mass to be in the middle. Okay. If I have objects that are not symmetrical, say for example, I have something that looks like a trapezoid, finding the center of mass of this guy is not going to be that easy. Um, or if I have something like this, a half circle, uh, it turns out that there is one line of symmetry that's obvious, which is from uh, the vertical line of symmetry, but there's no horizontal line of symmetry. So um, also, if the density of the object is not constant, finding the center of mass may be difficult. And in the good old days, um, which is when I was an undergraduate student, the only options you had were really to uh, find the center of mass for these weird shapes using calculus. And that still is a viable option. And in fact, if you look in many textbooks, uh, they show you how to do it, and then they give you tables of the center of mass of different shaped objects. In today's world, uh, one of the ways that this is done is when you design a real object, uh, you can get your CAD program that you use to enter the object or the design into a computer to find your center of mass for you. So that can be kind of handy. Okay, so anyway, uh, in the situation where we have an obvious center of mass, uh, it's easy then to say that uh, gravity uh, or the force of gravity is a single concentrated force acting on the center of mass. Also, when we have other distributed types of forces, so for example, a distributed reaction force. So here I have a box that's being held up by something, and it's a contact across the width of the box. And so I've got a distributed force here. Um, if this force is uniform, like I've drawn here, then it's pretty easy to figure out what the equivalent force ought to be. Uh, it will be a force directed in the same direction as the distributed force. 
Uh, in this case, it would be P times L, because P is Newton's per meter. That's basically the uh, magnitude of the distributed force. I have L meters, and so I'd have P times L. This would, um, this force would be applied in the middle of the box, so that these two guys would both be L over 2. Okay, so again, that's easy because the force is uniform and it's symmetric. Um, if the force is not uniform or symmetric, then it might be more difficult. So, for example, if I go back to this case where I've got a fairly complex distribution uh, due to the fact that uh, the weight distribution on your foot is not always uniform, finding this equivalent force, uh, both the magnitude and where this force would be applied, is not trivial and may actually require some integration or something like that. So, um, my goal is to avoid talking about the integrals and so on that uh, create or that you use to find a center of uh, mass or to find uh, the equivalent location for a force. We'll do a, f a few of those integrals, but not many. If this is something that you think would be extremely helpful for you to understand better, if you'd like to see this done, uh, leave comments in this video or on this video. And if there's enough interest in uh, showing how to do these computations with integrals, I'll do a couple of examples just of that. So finally, to go back to our, our example before, if we want to find the forces acting on this box due to gravity and due to the reaction force, we know that the force due to gravity will be applied at the center of mass. And in this case, because there are some obvious lines of symmetry, we know that the center of mass is here, one half meter up and one and a half meters over. Uh, if the mass of this guy, let's say the mass, the total mass is 50 pounds, or I'm sorry, 50 kilograms, then the magnitude of the force due to gravity will be the gravitational constant times the mass which the gravitational constant is uh, more or less 9.8 meters per second squared. So that would give us 490 newtons. And that would be applied in a downward direction uh, from the center of gravity. Okay, now if I have this reaction force, um, the total magnitude of the reaction force is going to be 163.3 newtons per meter. That's the dent, or that's the magnitude um, of the reaction, uh, not the magnitude. Um, um, my mind just went blank. Anyway, this is the number that you multiply by the width of the box to get the total force, which would be 490 newtons. Okay. And this force would be applied at the bottom of the box in the middle because I have a symmetric and uniform force distribution. So basically, I'd have a force here, which would be the reaction force. OK, so hopefully you found this introduction helpful. Um, and uh, that should do it.